Hello again, everybody, and welcome to the end of week two. We're going to start off today by taking a look at how to actually solve yesterday's puzzle in C. So for those of you who were here, we were asking about this puzzle game, the Towers of Hanoi, where the monks had to move discs from one pole to the other pole, and we had our volunteers, Ryan and uh, someone else came down and helped him, I can't remember who it was later, who successfully solved the puzzle for us. But they were solving the puzzle for only four discs, and if you remember, in the myth that we told, there were actually 64 discs needed to solve the puzzle. And so this gives rise to a question for us, Will the monks who are moving these giant crystal disks actually be able to solve the puzzle before the heat death of the universe? So to do this, we're going to have to do an analysis of our algorithm like we did with find repeats in order to figure out the running time of the algorithm in proportion to the number of disks we have. In this case, the number of disks we have is going to represent the size of our problem. More disks, trickier problem. So let's first, so let's start by actually coding this up in C and seeing how we would write a solution to this algorithm. So I'm gonna start this one from scratch and this will be the most complicated program you've seen so far, but it is deceptively simple in the number of lines it takes to write it. So here we go and let's begin with our usual, oh, and it's autofilling things that I don't want, let's call this, Hanoi.c, uh, call it Hanoi2.c because I already have a Hanoi.c. And again, the mysterious syntax appears that we don't know quite what it is yet. And let's do a hash define for the number of disks we have. So let's, uh, Define n as four. Let's say we have four disks. Okay. Now all I'm going to do here is something very simple. I want to move the disks from A to B via C in this case. And how many disks? I have n disks. So that's going to be our function syntax that we want. But of course, this isn't sufficient. We haven't actually written the Hanoi function yet. So that's going to be our next task. So let's start off by writing the syntax. Now you'll notice here that I'm using the word void instead of something like integer or char. Why am I doing this? Well, it's because the Hanoi function is not actually designed to return anything to the user. So this gives us a new word for us to use in C, void, which means no type. It's a type that stands in for when something doesn't have a specified type. So because this function isn't going to return anything, we're just going to use void. So now let's add some chars. From via to, oh, I messed up when I said before, we're moving it from A to C via B. So we're trying to get it onto that third disk. And now remember our strategy from yesterday. Uh, where's the microphone gone, Hassan? Who remembers what our strategy was from yesterday, the fundamental insight that led us to be able to solve the problem? Yeah, I've forgotten your name, but you'll, you can tell us again in a second when you get the microphone. Asan, switch it on. And the light will turn green and then we're good. Hello? Yeah. Yeah, so I think the strategy was just to move a lot of the top pieces to a, an empty uh, pole so that we can manipulate the disk around. Yeah, so our strategy was learn how to solve the problem for a slightly smaller version, use a recursive call to solve that problem, move the last disk onto the final resting place, and then move the smaller pile back onto the place where it should be. What was your name? Uh, Chris. Chris. Okay, so Chris gave us our strategy, which is solve the problem for n minus one, move the biggest disk onto the, onto the final place you want it, and then move the smaller pile, that n minus one pile, back on top. So if we were to write that as a recursive function, it would look something like this. So n is less than or equal to zero. Well, that's an invalid call, or there's nothing to do, just return. Otherwise, what we want to do, we want to do from to via n minus one. Now this syntax looks a little funny, but what we've actually done is we've changed the order of from which pole to which pole we want to move things. Say we have poles, uh, let's do n there. Say we have poles A, B, and C, 
And our initial goal is to move all the disks from A to C via B. When we solve the problem for n minus 1, when we solve the smaller thing, we don't want to move the smaller pile onto C. That's where we want to move the largest disk. We want to move the smaller pile onto the extra pole in the middle temporarily. And so that's what this line is doing. It's allowing us to take the disks from the, the initial pole A. So let's say from was A, via was B, and 2 was C. And in this one, we solve the problem for the smaller pile of disks. We want to move the smaller pile of disks from A to uh, via C to B. Because we want the smaller pile to end up on, on the middle pole so that the last pole is actually free for us to then move the largest disk. So that's what's happening here. If you get stuck with it, I'd encourage you to actually run this program a few times. Try it with n equals 1, n equals 2, n equals 3, and it'll become a little bit clearer. But that's essentially what's going on there. And now all I'm going to do is I'm going to print what's happening. For i equals 1, I have a loop. i is less than or equal to n, i plus plus. So print f. I'm just going to print some spaces. And then print f. So the reason I'm using chars is just for us to be able to see where the disks are being moved. So let's do this. And then the last thing I have to do, so I've moved the small pile. What's the other thing that's remaining for me to do next to Chris? Person next to Chris. So if I manage to move the disks from the smaller pile, what's the look for? If I've managed to move the disks from the, the smaller pile of disks into the middle pile, what's the other thing I have to do? There are two other things I have to do to solve the problem. So if I have four disks, I move three disks to the middle, what do I have to do after that? Move the two disks. <laughs> move the other two disks. So I only have one disk. So I, if I have four, I've moved the three pile, I have the bottom disk. What do I do with the bottom disk? Move it. I move it onto the third pole. The third pole, and then what do I have to do after that? There's one more step. So I now have three disks on the middle pole and one disk on the last pole. To finish it, where do I move the, the disks from the middle pole? Onto the third pole. Yeah, onto the last pole. So that's all we have to do. So that's, let's actually write that in code. So Hanoi via from two and minus one. So this line is just moving that middle pile of disks from B now, back onto C. So from B to uh, via A to C. So again, every time we run this recursive function, these lines, these comment lines, aren't necessarily going to be act the same, because to, from, and via are going to change as we solve the smaller and smaller problems. But at least for the starting one, commenting it out like this can help you understand how this one is actually working. So let's give that one a run. Clang, I called this Hanoi 2. Oh no, I have made a mistake. So what have I forgotten? You didn't mention the, which variable it is in printf. So in printf, I forgot my variables, which I always do. And there's another error, and someone other than Toby. It was James. Yeah, I need the prototype up the top. So let's copy my function prototype and put it up the top. And now it looks like it's happy. Almost. Uh, what have I done here from i to n, i plus plus? Oh, i equals one. Yep, it's the, it's the stupidest mistakes that get you. OK. There we go. So you can see the full list of moves that we had before. Yes, James, you have a question? Just thinking. Um, so we have a, a full list of moves that we had before. OK, Corinna, you have a question? That is correct that I just, oh no, I compiled Hanoi too. You're right, I compiled Hanoi 2. There is Hanoi 1, that's the pre-written version in case things go really wrong with my live coding. Uh, yes, it was Jack. Um, why are you 
like printing just an empty line? Um, that's just printing a, some spaces so that you can see that it's been indented by recursive call. It's just, for, it's just for visualizing it. It's not because it actually changes the program. OK, so now we're ready. We've seen our program, and now we're ready to do our analysis. Actually, let me switch back to this for a second. So one thing that we might want to do is write a relationship between the number of disks we have and the number of operations we have to do, the number of disk moves we have to do. So let's look inside our Hanoi function. And we see that we have to solve the problem for n minus 1. So however many disks we move for n minus 1, we've got to do it once here. And then we've got to move n minus 1 disks another time there. And beyond that, Corinna, how many extra disks did I have to move on top of that? So I moved the small pile. And I, on top of that, I move. I, I was just moving that one biggest disk. So I move the two small piles, however many moves that takes, plus the one big move. So let's write that out as a relationship. So to solve the, a puzzle for n disks, it's going to take as many steps as it takes to solve n minus 1 disks twice, because we're going to move that small pile twice. And then we're going to move the largest disk on top of that. So this gives us a relationship. Um, and I will probably post the derivation for you online. But with a tiny bit of algebra, we can solve this recurrence relation to get the following outcome. We get 2 to the n minus 1. Now, if we, you remember our big O graphs, we had our linear, uh, our, we had our programs that run in linear time, which was nice. We have our programs that run in log time or n on 2. Those were also nice. This is running in 2 to the n. That's really, really, really big. 2 to the n grows fast. How fast? Well, let's say we have two disks. This is only going to take us three steps to actually complete the puzzle. If we have four disks, it's going to take 15, 16. Whoa, this is growing fast. It's 16 disk, disks. It's already up to 65,000. And by the time we get to 32, this is 2 to the 32, so we have 2 billion steps already. And how many disks did the monks have? We said they had 64 disks. So that is 584 billion years to move all the disks from one place to the other, assuming one disk a second. Um, my computer is a little bit faster than the monks who have to physically pick them up. It does about, we said, 2 to the 10 operations per second. So 2 to the 64 divided by 2 to the 10, that's 2 to the 54 seconds for my computer to solve this problem which is 570 million years. So my computer probably isn't going to be able to solve the problem for n equals 64 either. So poor monks, but lucky world, it looks like we're going to survive another day. So now we're going to talk about another concept in C, and then we'll get into our fun demos for the day. So this is scope. And essentially, the idea here is that C wants to restrict your ability to mess with other parts of your own program unnecessarily. When I say mess with other parts of your program, typically that means variables. So if you've defined a variable in one function, you don't want that function to automatically be able to mess with the variables inside another function. And so the authors of the C programming language came up with some helpful rules that our compiler interprets to hide variables from different parts of the program. And let's do a couple of demos on that, and then we'll see what both what powers it gives us, but also what challenges it creates. We essentially have uh, two or three different scopes that you will probably care about significantly in the course. The first of these is global scope. This is a variable that's visible to any function in the whole program within your C file. So if you declare a global variable that's outside of any other function, that variable will be visible to all the other functions and inside those functions. Now, we do run into an issue when you copy the name of the variable and you declare it twice in two different scopes. So let's say you make a variable x in your global scope. And let's do this. So I'm going to create a new program, uh, standard io.h, void main. So by setting void main here, what I've actually said is my main function isn't going to return a value back to the shell. Probably not a great idea. So let's put it back to int. It's just a bad habit. OK, return 0. And I'm going to declare a global variable. So let's call this x. And I'm going to set it equal to 3. 
Now, you can't run large amounts of code outside, let's call this global 1.c. Now, you can't actually run significant amounts of code in, in this global scope. All you can really do is declare variables, but C actually will allow you to declare a variable like this and set its value, even though technically this isn't really part of the program's running code. The reason is because when the compiler runs and creates our program, it's actually able to resolve that line without doing any significant calculations. That's a very simple one, and so it just puts the number three and stores it in the program, and we'll talk more about this soon. So now if I go print f percentage d x and give this a run, it will actually work. But here's the gotcha. Now let's say that the variable name x is one that I want to reuse inside the main function. And I do int x equals 4. The compiler isn't actually going to complain in this instance unless you've turned on a whole lot of error messages, which are optional. And now I see x equals 4. So this has done what we call shadowing the global variable. We've hidden it. The main function is no longer able to see that variable because we've doubled up on the name. And this is another potential source of errors. And we can see this in a little more detail if I were to create another function. So let's call this function test. and we'll get it to print x. Oh, non-void function, there we go. Return zero, really, let's make this one a void function because it's not gonna do anything interesting. So let's just return, and then I'm going to run my test function, and as always, I have to remember to include the prototype. So, So now when I call my test function, my test function sees the global x, but my main function, because it's shadowed that variable, is no longer able to see the global x. Instead, it sees the local x. And if I want to be really nasty, now let's do something like this. Let's print x here. And this program's actually still going to run. Uh, let's, instead of x plus plus, let's make that x equals 7. There we go. So now it's get, getting really confusing. What my main function does the first time, it prints the global variable, it changes the global variable to 7, it creates a local variable that now hides the global variable and prints that one, and then my test function runs and prints the global variable again. And so now, as a result, the global variable is set to 7, like my main function did. But when my main function changes the local variable, we now see the local variable when we print it inside of main. So this gets tricky very, very quickly. Yes? Um, what happens if you go, like, text is like, what I add underneath? Under here? Yeah. yeah. So let's try that. Do we expect anything to change? Okay, hands up if you think things will change. Hands on heads if nothing will change. Okay, we see roughly an even split. Okay, let's see. Same result as before. And the reason is, is because test is printing the global variable, not the local variable. Because inside test, there's no declaration. There's no variable declaration which shadows the x. So it's the global x that's actually running. So let's look at a couple of pre-prepared demos now. And let's make the terminal a little smaller. I'm going to clear that and make that bigger. OK. So I have a function func. It takes in a variable x, and I have three vari uh, two variables here, x and z. I'm going to print the values of x and z. Then I'm going to run this function, print the variables again, run the function again, and print the variables again. So the first time I run the function, the argument, the input to the function is going to be x. So we could say input should be 3. And then what happens inside of here? Well, the function declares a variable z. It's, it declares a new variable. And then it adds one to x, 
adds x and z together and adds one to that and then prints them. And then over here, we're putting z as the input to our function and let's see what happens. And then we'll do a bit of an explainer because this one might be a bit counterintuitive. So let's call this scope 1.c. Okay, now we've got some explaining to do. So let's go line by line. When we reach our print the first time, we get x, we have input x and z as three and five respectively. So that matches up what we'd expect to see. Now func runs. Funk's over here. The input should have been three. So x would be three. So we can do three plus one, it should be four. And z is, is z five or is z seven? Now we've got this interesting question because in our main function here, z is, seven, is five, but inside our func, we've declared another variable z. Now this is not like our global variable. Let's do an example now where I declare z like this. Actually, no, let's still scrap that. We're gonna stick with the code as is. In my main function, z is five, but I've created a new variable inside func. Now, one thing that we have to know is when a variable is not global, it only exists inside the function within which it was declared. So z, before this line runs, if this line runs, sorry, if I comment out these lines, it's as if z does not exist from the perspective of func. So if you were to run this line, z equals x plus z plus one, you can already see I get a, a squiggly line under z because the func function doesn't know what z is. z has only been declared inside the main function. This was different when we used a global variable. A global variable was visibly, visible globally. It was visible everywhere. But our local variables, our variables inside the functions are not. So when we run this line, we've created a new variable called z that's not the same as the other z. You can imagine it's a separate box somewhere in the computer's memory. And now that's the one we're modifying. So we would expect to see four plus seven plus one, 12. Now we go back to our main function and we print x and z. Now remember, this was a different z. That's why it's happening when we still get z equals to 5, even though on the previous line z is equal to 12. They're actually separate boxes in the computer's memory. They're separate locations. They're in separate scopes. And so what we did to the z inside func doesn't actually affect the z inside main. So if we print over here, we get three and five again. And now let's run func, only this time we're passing in z as the input. Now let's look very carefully at our func over here. Func takes in one input, and in this case we're calling the input x at the point in time in which it's gone into the function. Before it's gone into the function, it might have a different name somewhere else inside the program, but as soon as we copy it into the function, its name has changed inside that function for the purposes of that function. So when we say func z over here, it's using the z from main. So input is five. But as soon as we end up in here, that value five is now inside a variable called x because that's what we've told the compiler we want to label the input. So what is actually happening at the end of the day is these variable names they're just labels for different locations in memory. And this is what we're going to talk about with some of our demos very soon. The difference between the name of a location in memory and the place of a location. It's just like changing the number sign on the front of your house. Just because you change the label of the house or if you change the street sign on the corner, doesn't actually change the contents of your house. The contents of your house stay the same no matter what the street sign says. And that's essentially what's happening with our variables here. We're just changing the street sign that's in front of our variables. So now we've passed in five, we've replaced the street sign. It's the street sign now says X and we've created a new variable. And this one has a label above it that says Z and that contains seven. So Z is seven, X we copied in five. So this is five plus one which is six, and then five plus one plus one plus seven is 14. And then the, func the function func ends, and we get to this line here. 
And remember what I said, when a function ends, all the variables that were inside of it previously get destroyed, and it's if, as if they don't exist in any way anymore. So now we're back inside our main function, and our main function has different variables, different variables with their own street signs, and it's the ones we were familiar with before. It's just the same x and the same z. Okay, let's do one or two more demos of scope, and then we'll get to some more fun stuff. So again, if you're having trouble with some of these, I would encourage you to go run them, run them play around with them. That's going to be the best way to really get a feel. So now I'm introducing a slight modification to the prior program. All I've done here is I've added the word static. Now the word static does something special. What it does is it sets the variable apart from all the other ones and puts it in a special place in the computer's memory. And now when the function is destroyed, that particular variable is not destroyed. It keeps its value from what it was before. So if the function runs once and that static variable was set to seven, when the function runs again, its value will stay at seven and this initialization line won't run again. Now let's say we run the function and now it's eight at the end of the function. But we get to this line static int z equals seven again, but that line isn't going to run. The variable's already been created previously. That's one of the special things that static does. So let's give it a run and see how it changes things. Oh, scope three. So now we can see that z is, x is three and z is five as long as we are in our main function. Why? Because the main function still has its variables that are scoped specially to main. Nothing inside of func can change the values inside of main. However, our value z over here, which we're printing out x and z here, is actually being changed each time. So z, when this function ran for the second time, instead of starting off as seven, started off as 12, because that's what it was at the end of the prior run of func. And do we wanna do one more scope demo? Maybe, let's see. No. I think that is probably enough on scope, with one exception. So I need a volunteer, someone who hasn't volunteered previously. Yes, you, who's looking around. You did too much looking circumspect, so now you're forced to come down to the front. Can we have a round of applause? And the microphones are sun. Yep, you need to come down. What's your name? Linda. Linda is our scientist for today. Okay. And here I have some chemicals for you. Take, take hold of that one. So this is actually a compilation of students from past years who've taken FOA. These are their tears, and uh, this is their sweat. Yeah. Doesn't look quite like sweat, but I'm not gonna say the other thing it could be. Okay, so let's, let's hold them up for everyone. Okay, here, is our, here are our variables. What do you wanna call this variable? Red. Red. And what do you wanna call this variable? Green. Green? <laughs> that is going to get very, very confusing very fast. Let's call them X and Y. So let's see, do I have a marker or anything? Um, uh, we're just going to remember for the time that this is X and this is Y. So what I want you to do, you're in a very experienced chemist, right? No. Have you taken any chemistry? Sort of. Sort of? At uni? No. Okay, so I think this will be fun for us then. If, if there is an emergency spill, don't worry. I've got zero, zero, zero on speed dial. I told them in advance we may lose a student today. Um, so what I want you to do is to swap the contents of X into Y, and I want the contents of Y to be in X. How do I do that? I mean, you're the chemist. Um, anyone want to help? <laughs> Asan, nah, not happening. You have a water bottle. I have a water bottle? Sophie, what, what's your suggestion? Oh, Sophie's been uh, spying on me. So she knows that I indeed have another variable under the lectern. Okay, so, sorry, I missed your name again. Linda. It was Linda. Linda, do you think we can solve the problem now? Probably. Probably, okay. So X, Y, and let's call this Z. Okay, Linda, how are we gonna swap them? Just pour 
pull one into here and then pull that one into there and then pull this one over there. Okay, I'm going to go to the computer and I'm going to type out our process and you're going to run the process live in front of everyone while telling me what you're doing with the variables. Now wait, I'm going to get us set up. So int, uh, sorry, include o.h and int main, and I'm just going to ignore those funny arguments for now and just say that our main function isn't going to take in anything. Return zero, and I'm going to call my function swap. So int x and y, I'll call this swap dot, uh, I'll call this y swap. And instead of making them integers, let's make them characters, uh, chars, because we can put red and blue in chars. So let's do int x, x has what color in it? Red. Red, and oh, let's make that a char. And y has, y has what color in it? Blue. Y has blue in it. And now let's write a function. What should I call my function? Swap. Swap seems pretty good. OK. So let's call my function swap. And we want to swap x and y. And we should also print what's happening. So let's do a print f x y new line. And let's copy that line over here. So now I need to write my swap function. And we'll make our swap function a void because we don't need it to return anything. So void swap char x char y. And what else did we need on top of this to make this whole process work? An empty bottle. And what's our empty bottle? Z. Z. So let's have a char z. And we're not going to fill anything in that for the moment. OK, you ready? Um, Asan, we might need you at the front, actually, to hold the microphone. Can somebody else just do the pouring? Because I'm not confident in the pouring. That's the fun of this. That, that's what you get the, the, re the reward for. Asan, do you want to hold her microphone? And she is going to read out for us what she's doing. That's a memory leak. <laughs> it's a memory leak. That's very funny. What happens if I accidentally do it wrong? If you do it wrong, then uh, we will go. We'll see what happens if you, if, if you do it wrong. <laughs> okay. I shall pour the red, the X into the empty bottle Z. OK, X into Z. So Z equals X. Whatever was in X before is now in Z. We've sprung a leak. Yes, I'm sorry. It's OK. It's fine. We can collect more sweat and stuff. <laughs> Asan, you're going to have to hold the microphone a little closer. And then I think I'm pouring the blue into the egg. Wait, it wasn't blue. What variable was that? Y. Y? Y is being poured into? X. So X is getting whatever was in Y before. I am not very good at this. I'm sorry, Kathleen Fitzpatrick Theatre. And then I'm pouring Z into Y, I think. OK, so Y now gets Z. There we go. I've kind of made a mess. Wonderful. You can take this. Have you ever considered switching your major to chemistry? No. I think you'd be an excellent chemist. Can we have a round of applause? <laughs> Thanks, Hassan. So, okay. Now I'm ready to do the swapping on my, on my computer. And let's give it a try. Let's run clang y swap and see if it works. I'm pretty confident that this is going to work because Linda showed us beautifully how to do it. Let's see. Let's call this y swap. Um, ha, 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 the usual problem. Somehow I always forget to say what I want to print and scan. OK. Uh, there. That was silly. OK, there we go. Now let's run Y swap. Uh-oh, that's, that's not good. Does anyone know what's going on? Um, OK, Toby, you, you will get a chance later. 
Uh, Pranav, did you, was that a hand up? No? Okay, someone new who hasn't answered. Cassie, we heard from you recently. Over here. Remind me your name again. I think you've answered once before at least. Uh, my name is Rex. Oh, Rex, yeah, yeah, of course. So this is an issue with scope. Yeah, this is an issue with scope. Does anyone else, now that, now that Rex has told us what the issue is, does someone have an idea? We've just been talking about it for a few minutes. Yeah, over here. Rex, do you want to get the mic? Asan, you go for a run. Over this side. Put your hand up again. Okay, explain really loudly with the microphone close what's going on for everyone to hear. I think the print, the, the second print. Hold the microphone really close and yell. I think the second print. <laughs> <laughs> That's not going to work. I think that the second print, like, Below the swap, is X is give no is giving X instead of Y. Why were you supposed to put Y over there? And I don't know for some. And uh, it didn't actually swap anything. Well, it didn't swap anything, but we followed the right procedure. Maybe let's give the microphone to. Uh, were you Pranava Divyanch? Divyanch, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, guys. <laughs> I'll get it right. I think the because they are local variable in swap only, so it didn't reflect in the main function. Yeah, so remember we had this phenomenon that we saw before where if we use the variable inside a function, it would only change inside the function. Now, why is that? That goes to a very deep part of the C programming language, which is that C is what we call pass by value. This is a fancy way of saying when you give a variable to a function, you're not actually giving it the street address of that variable. What you're doing is you're photocopying that variable and handing the photocopy to the other function. So in this case, I'm giving a photocopy of the red and the blue jars. It does the swap, but it's only doing that swap inside the function to those copies. The original ones have stayed the same. So now if I add, if I go and change my print statement over here and I print it at the start of swap and at the end of swap, let's now say start swap and end swap. We can actually see that the swap function is working. It is swapping those variables but it's actually swapping copies of those variables that have been made inside the swap function. So when we go back to our main, our original jars haven't been affected. So this gives us a bit of a puzzle and a bit of a problem because we probably are going to want to swap things. I mean, if this was all you could do with C and that was it, game over for us, we're pretty limited. So this is where we're going to need to introduce some very heavy new conceptual material. Now, I will give you a warning and say that this material that's going to follow is some of the more challenging material in the class, so don't worry if you don't get it immediately. So before we get onto that, I want to give you one little um, extra bonus piece that we're going to start doing every week from now on. So at the start of every week, from here on, I'm going to present to us one figure from the history of computer science. So you can breathe easy again. We're not going to touch the dreaded memory just yet. This is Ada Lovelace. Uh, August, Aga August Ada King, Countess of Lovelace was her full title. And she was one of the progenitors of the computer in the first place. Now, while she didn't actually have a modern digital computer, along with Charles Babbage, she envisioned the idea of a calculating machine. She is also considered to be the mother of algorithms because she created what we consider to be the first ever algorithm. And in fact, there is a programming language named after her, Ada. So from now on, at the start of every week, we're gonna see someone new and exciting and hopefully use that as a way to launch into some of our discussions. And along with that theme, there is another figure who I also want to introduce us to. So this is Lynn Ann Conway. She was born in 1938, and she is one of the most prominent transgender computer scientists. She was responsible for developing the very large-scale integrated microchip design, or VLSI. 
And the basic idea here is that a modern computer has lots and lots of different components, and if you have to wire them all up separately, your components are going to work together pretty slowly because every time a signal goes from one part of, to the other of the computer, it has to traverse these long wires. So one of the things that Lynn Conway came up with was this notion of building onto a single piece of silicon all the different components that might have to talk to each other. Now, of course, you can't do that with every part of the computer. You can't put your CD drive, if you still have one, on the same silicon wafer as your central processor. That's not going to work. But at least you can start to put chunks of the computer's memory and chunks of the computer's processing power very close next to each other so that they can communicate very, very quickly. Now, 10 years ago, if you looked inside a computer, you might not have seen this design everywhere. But now, who here has a, an M1, M2, or M3 Mac? Put up your hand. So all of these Macs rely on this design, where they've actually tightly integrated the memory onto the same silicon as the rest of the chip, and this is why they're so power efficient and why they are able to run so quickly. So this was one of the big new changes recently. And here we have actually the design of a piece of modern computer memory. So this is at the 200 micrometer level. Now we have talked a little bit about the notion of a computer's memory actually being a physical thing. It's at the end of the day recording the physical state of some atoms inside some physical circuitry. Whether they're magnetized or whether they're demagnetized, whether they produce an electric field or whether they don't produce an electric field. So where, Zane's not here today, but he could probably give us a, a bit more of a rundown on this from the physics perspective. But from the perspective of a programmer, we really don't want to be thinking about this all the time. If you have to figure out where exactly in the computer's memory the particular thing you're looking for and give it the physical location, okay, it's at centimeter four, micrometer 35, nanometer two, it's not gonna be very useful. So instead what we want to do is we want to treat our system's memory like a contiguous block. What this means is we start at location zero and end at location, well, however much memory we have. So if we have two to the 32 bits, our addresses, our locations in the computer's memory, our street addresses, will go all the way from zero to two to the 32, such that each one of those locations maps to one possible value that the computer can hold. And so now we're starting to get somewhere. Now we need to establish a link between our computers, between our variables and the addresses, the locations in the computer's memory, and then we can rely on the actual circuitry of the computer to convert those addresses down to the actual physical locations. So at some point you can imagine a, a small, like a, a chipmunk gets the address from the program and says, uh, set this var variable to one. The chipmunk looks in and looks th flips through its pages. It says, oh, X is stored at this location. Uh, it's stored at nine Main Street. So it goes along, here's nine. Okay, I'm gonna flip that bit to one and flips the bit goes back. The next line in the program comes up, set Z to 14. So the chipmunk goes, oh, Z is at location 27. Okay, goes, flips the bits that it needs to uh, set Z to 17, and then goes back. So this chipmunk model is something that uh, we can represent without having to think about the actual chipmunk. Asan, Asan is sad, he likes the chipmunk. Um, so in essence, when we're programming, we can forget this because of the power of abstraction again, that the programming of the actual hardware allows us to abstract away, and that our compiler allows us to abstract away from even thinking about the addresses most of the time. We just use variable names, and then those names get converted to addresses, and then those addresses get converted to physical locations. So now we have a representation that will look kind of familiar to you. It's of boxes in which we can fit different data. So the operating system is also going to tell us where out of all the boxes it's permissible for us to put data and where it's impermissible. Now, why might we want to do this? Why is the operating system caring about which of these boxes we put stuff in? And Asan, do you still have the microphone? Yeah. Um, Jai, do you want to answer this one? So we have all these boxes in which memory could possibly be stored, in which our program could possibly touch, right? All the way from zero, two to the 32. But the operating system is going to say, actually, no, your program is only going to be allowed to touch boxes 
10 to 35. Why is this an important thing for the operating system to do? Take a guess. Doesn't matter if you're wrong. Save the memory. To so save memory? So tell us a bit more about this. That, that's one good idea. Who are we saving memory for or from? So I'll give you a hint. Let's say I have my program, awesome program one, and I'm also running Google Chrome at the same time. So for this case, uh, program one will take a place of the memory and Google Chrome will take a place for, of the memory. Yeah, and what's, what happens if the operating system has no rules about who takes what memory? Um, the computer might not function if there's too much of program. Yeah, so one program might monopolize all the memory in the computer. So Google Chrome would say, I am so awesome. I have 50 tabs. I've got BBC News. I've got Farago. I've got the Melbourne Uni website. I've got the LMS. And then my awesome program one, which is meant to calculate a cure for cancer, never runs. It just didn't get the memory. Google Chrome stole it all. Now, on the other hand, let's say that you have my super secret program one, which has the nuclear launch codes for Australia's fleet of nuclear submarines. I see some smokes there at least. Um, so the launch codes are stored in my super secret program, and yet Google Chrome is running on the side. If the operating system is not setting any rules about who can touch what memory, uh, when you visit that cute uh, the cute uh, TikTok video, then, then TikTok's website could read those nuclear launch codes, which is probably something we don't want. Likewise, we probably don't want the secret nuclear launch program that you're for some reason running on your TikTok computer to be able to see the embarrassing TikTok videos that you're running that might embarrass you in front of your employer who's trusting you with these very top secret codes. Um, so at the end of the day, this operating system's role is very, very important. And what happens if your program tries to touch a location that it's not allowed to, that it's not meant to have access to, or that's beyond the memory that's been allocated to it? Segfault. You will see this word soon in your programs and you will come to hate it. It is a sign that you are touching memory that you are not allowed to. And as we are about to give you more powerful tools to mess with your computer's memory, you will get it wrong sometimes. And when you get it wrong, you will get a seg fault. Now, the other thing that can happen, even if you're touching memory that you are allowed to touch, but it's memory that logically doesn't make sense for you to touch, you can start messing with variables inside your own program and mess them up. So just because the operating system is stopping two programs from messing with each other, doesn't mean it's gonna stop your own program from messing with itself in a bad way. So as we start to give you these tools to choose which locations in memory you're actually going to be modifying, this is the other thing that can cause your program to exhibit a behavior that's unexpected, is if you have tampered with memory and you weren't meant to tamper with it. So modern operating systems also don't let you use address zero. Uh, zero is reserved for null, for the null pointer. And we're going to start using this word pointer to talk about a variable that refers to a specific location, a specific address in the computer's memory. And why do we need to save the zero? Well, we need to know when the variable is empty, when it's not pointing to anything. And so the operating system and the compiler just say, okay, we're gonna save memory address zero for just an indicator that we are not referring to anything at all. Now, the last thing I wanna show you today is a preview of where we are going. So now that we know that the computer and the operating system conspire to divide up memory, how do they actually divide up memory? Well, they create what, they, what are called segments. These are areas of the computer's address space, that set of addresses from zero to two to the 32 or two to the 64 or whatever you have, and they reserve different parts of this space for different types of things. So for example, from one gigabyte, of, one gigabyte might be reserved for information for the operating system. Now, this is not hard disk space, this is inside your computer's temporary memory, so where you'd store variables. So it's gonna reserve some of that space just for the operating system to manage things at all times. So that might be from address 0xffff all the way to address 
0xc0000. Now, when I say 0x, that's just saying what I'm actually talking about here is base 16. We could write these numbers in base 10 as decimal numbers, but because addresses get really large, it's just going to be more space efficient if along with the numbers 0 to 9, we also use the letters A to F as part of our digits. So we go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, A, B, C, D, E, F, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 2, 1, 3, 1, 4, 1, 5, 1, 6, 1, 7, 1, 8, 1, 9, 1, A, 1, B, 1, C, 1, D, 1, E, 1, F. And that just allows us to represent more in those two digits than we, in those two, in those two characters than we did if we were just using the digits 0 to 9. So that's the top part uh, of the memory is perhaps that part saved for the operating system. And what I'm going to leave you with today is so far all we've done, all the variables we've created reside in this area called the stack. And this is going to be a size of memory that the operating system expands as you need more of it up to a certain limit. Next week, we'll talk about how to actually determine the location of an individual variable within the stack and how to start manipulating things. And with that, please have a wonderful weekend and I'll see you for one more week before I go overseas. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.